All right, so chapter 30, aggregate demand and aggregate supply. This is the model that we are going to use to show changes in the economy um, and what they lead to. So for example, we're going to model recessions and expansions, short run, long run, and also how different fiscal and monetary policies can help correct economic fluctuations. Okay, so let's start with aggregate demand. And aggregate means total all. And so we are looking at the amount of output of real GDP. Okay, so the amount of total output that is desired at each price level. Okay. And there is an opposite relationship between price level and output demanded. Now, this is going to be a little bit different than what we learned in supply and demand. Okay. Before we were doing supply and demand of an apple. Okay. And so, you know, price level went up. We demanded a lower quantity of apples. Price level went down. We did it less quantity of apples. Um, but now we're looking at the demand for all the goods and services in the economy. So there are going to be different uh, variables that affect aggregate demand and what affected, um, for example, the demand for one good or one service. Okay, aggregate demand is based. Once again, you know we're looking at GDP. So C I G and NX. Okay, so we're going to look at why the aggregate demand slopes downward. Okay, so let's assume that G over here, you know, this is government spending, so let's say this is independent of the price level. So we're going to look at how a change in the price level affects C, I, and NX. Okay. We have price level, and this is based on the CPI. This is the overall price level that prevails in the economy. Um, we're not looking at the price level for a single good anymore. We're looking at the price level um, for all the goods and services. And then horizontal axis is real GDP, it's output. Okay, so just a reminder, we're no longer doing price and quantity of an apple. We're doing remodeling the relationship between the real output and the price level in the economy. And so we see here that when Consumers demand a lower level of output. Okay, and so we have the three effects for this. And the first one is the real balances effect, and this will affect consumption. Okay. And just for a side note, to help me remember, in brackets next to aggregate demand, I sometimes will write C, I, are the factors that influence aggregate demand. So an increase in the price level will lower the quantity of total output demanded through the real balances effect. And essentially this is when, again, this isn't the price of one good going up. This is the price of all goods in the economy rising. And so now everything is more expensive. So households, businesses, because the consumer isn't just a household demanding, you know, like TVs. It's also, you know, the government demanding um, goods and services, um, also firms demanding goods and services, and also foreigners abroad demanding U.S. goods and services. Okay. So price level goes up, everything is more expensive. And so households, let's say your income is $30,000 and everything 
that you buy rises by an average of 10%, you can now buy less goods and services um, than before. And so we call this the real balances effect. When the price level in the economy rises on all goods and services, we demand a lower quantity of output. Okay, and so we go from point A to point B. All right, let's then model the interest rate effect. So as price level rises, C falls. As price level rises, okay, we'll do the next effect here. Again, the quantity of output falls and through the interest rate effect, what ends up happening is since goods and services are more expensive, firms will demand more money in order to be able to buy these, these more expensive goods and services. And with a higher demand for money, this will drive up the interest rate. Well, what happens with higher interest rates? Do um, consumers and Firms want to save more money, or would they want to spend their money? They would want to save their money because they would be earning a higher rate of return um, for putting their money in a bank. So investment ends up falling. Okay. And then we have the foreign purchases effect. Mm. Let's do some erasing here just to redraw the graph. Some more room. Okay. So price level, real GDP or real output, aggregate demand. And as always, I like to put C, I, G, and N X next to it. So when price level rises. Quantity demanded of output falls. Okay, and that is because price level rises, net exports will drop. And the reason being is that when U.S. price level rises relative to a foreign price level, then foreigners will buy U.S. goods because they are now more expensive relative to foreign goods, and then Americans will buy more foreign goods since they are now cheaper relative to U.S. goods. And so what ends up happening is net exports uh, drops. Exports fall, and when net exports is exports minus imports. So exports fall and imports drop leading to an overall fall in net exports. Okay, so why does the aggregate demand curve slope downward? It's because whenever price level goes up, consumption goes down, investment goes down, net exports go down. Uh, or, or, and then, so in other words, because of the real balances effect, interest rate effect, foreign purchases effect. And also, you know, the reverse is true too. If price level were to go down, then quantity of consumption of output increases, quantity of investment goods increases, and then and then net exports also falls. Now, notice that a change in the price level causes a movement along the aggregate demand curve. It is what helps us form the downward sloping demand curve, but it does not cause a shift 
What shifts the demand curve are other factors, which we'll talk about very shortly. But just know that a change in the price level will not shift the aggregate demand curve. It will only cause a movement. Okay, and this is what we've um, modeled. Sloping due to the real balance effect, interest rate effect, and foreign purchases effect. All right, so what causes a change in aggregate demand? Okay. Anything that changes consumption, investment, government purchases, and or net exports other than a change in price will shift the aggregate demand curve. Okay, again, I will repeat it because it's very important. Any factor that causes consumption, investment, government purchases, net exports to change other than a change in price will cause the aggregate demand curve to shift. Okay. So the first thing is something will happen that will change C, I, G, or NX, okay? These are called the determinants. The determinants are consumption, investment, government purchases, and net exports. So an event will happen other than a change in price that will affect the determinants over here. And then the size of the change will depend on the multiplier. Causes C I G or NX okay, to change in a positive direction will shift aggregate demand to the right. Okay. So anything that causes consumption, investment, government purchases, or net exports to increase will shift aggregate demand to the right. And anything that causes consumption, investment, government purchases, or net exports to decrease will shift aggregate demand to the left. Okay, so let's say the economy is stuck at this price level and a shift to the right will increase demand for total output at that price level and the shift to the left will decrease demand for output. All right, so what are some factors that can cause a change in consumption? Okay, so consumer wealth. So as consumers' assets go up in value, if their real estate increases in value, if their uh, 401ks increase in value, then consumers tend to feel better off and spend more money, and then vice versa. Okay. If they were to lose value in their real estate, um, if their, the stock market were to crash and they would lose a significant amount of money in their 401k, they will cut back on consumption. Also, household borrowing, so they can increase their consumption now by borrowing money A decrease in borrowing um, shifts aggregate demand to the left. The other thing that can shift aggregate demand to the left is if consumers start uh, saving more money in order to pay off existing debt, then you know, that will shift aggregate demand to the left as well. Also, expectations. Um, you know, if your company is announcing future layoffs, you know, and you're not sure if you're going to get laid off or not, you know, but there might be plans to be laid off, usually, you know, you will probably cut back on your spending just to prepare for the worst case scenario. Um, and then if the economy is doing well and, you know, everyone's finding jobs, then you, know, you might increase your spending on the hope that you'll find a job or that, you know, you'll get promoted or a nice pay increase. And then also taxes. Um, so of course, an increase in taxes will shift aggregate demand to the left because consumers will have a lower um, disposable income, and a decrease in taxes will shift aggregate demand to the right because consumers will have higher.
disposable income then. Okay, so investment spending, um, the, one of the big factors that affect investment spending are real interest rates. Here, um, the higher the real interest rate is, and essentially the higher the cost is for firms to borrow money in order to uh, undertake investment projects. And so, you know, higher real interest rates discourage investment spending, and lower real interest rates encourage investment spending. Also, you know, the expected returns that firms have about their projects. So, you know, if they feel future business conditions are going to be great, uh, there's going to be good demand for their product and continuous growth, then they will engage in investment spending. If they feel future business conditions are not going to be so great, um, then they will decrease their investment spending. But, you know, even now with you know, the oil glut here, Technology will increase returns on investment, and so any type of new technology will um, shift everybody's demand to the right. Degree of excess capacity, um, this is essentially how much unused capital is there. If there's a lot of unused capital, then investment spending will drop because businesses don't need to buy new capital if their current capital is being unused. Um, but if all their no excess capacity, then investment spending will rise to purchase new capital in order to increase production and business taxes. So an increase in business taxes will discourage investment spending and a decrease will encourage investment spending. Government spending? So pretty much if the government spends more money, it will shift aggregate demand to the right. And if the government decreases their spending, it will shift aggregate demand to the left. And net export spending. Um, two main factors here that affect this is how are our trading partners doing economically? If you know our big trading partners like Canada and Mexico are doing well economically, they tend to demand more US exports. If they're not, they demand less. U.S. exports, and also exchange rate. If the dollar depreciates, that means it's losing value, then um, uh, U.S. exports go up because now U.S. goods are cheaper to foreigners relative to um, foreign goods. And also U.S. consumers buy less imports since now U.S. goods seem cheaper to them. Uh, dollar appreciation, if the dollar increases in value, then exports will drop because now U.S. goods are more expensive relative to foreign goods. And also, uh, U.S. residents buy less U.S. goods and more imports since U.S. goods are now more expensive relative to foreign goods. Okay, we're going to move on to aggregate supply, and this is the total output that is produced by firms at each price level. And so the relationship between price level and output depends on the time horizon. So we will look at the immediate short run, the short run, and then the long run. So in the immediate short run, aggregate supply is horizontal, uh, meaning that price is very inflexible. It's not changing at all. And the immediate short run, the condition to qualify for the immediate short run is that input prices and output prices are fixed. They don't change. The minute that you can change one of them, then it's no longer the immediate short run. We go into just the short run. Okay. So input prices, again, are um, the cost of the goods and labor needed to make the output. Okay, so if I'm making wooden tables, then it would be the cost of my labor and what that's the input over there. Output prices is what I sell the table at. 
And so here, you know, demand for, let's say my tables in the immediate short run could be higher or it could be lower, but price is the same. You know, what are some scenarios that can be like this? Well, if I um, send out a catalog and I put the price of the table in the catalog, you know, then I have to honor that price for that time period I said. So if I said I'm selling the table for 400 um, and I'm expecting, let's say, 30 tables, uh, you know, I made 30 tables, excuse me, but people want to buy 35, then I can increase my supply to, let's say, 35. Or let's say people only want 25, then I will just go ahead and supply 25 over there. Okay. Now, as long as input and output prices are fixed, and I know I mentioned this before, okay, then we are in the immediate short run. But once I can change my output prices, then we go to the short run. Okay. And here in the short run, aggregate supply is sloped upward. Okay. And so there's a positive relationship between price level and output. So as price level goes up, for example, my output or output, total output increases. Okay, let's say this is full employment GDP, okay, over here. So what we find is that aggregate supply curve is flatter below the full employment uh, GDP because usually there's excess capacity, there's machines sitting idle. So once those machines are employed, firms will be able to respond to uh, changes in price by producing a large amount of output. However, it's steeper above the full employment GDP, and that is because uh, firms are already using all their capacity. And so they have capacity limitations in the short run. They, it's not enough time uh, to build new factories, for example. So it's hard to produce a lot more output with a change in price. So, for example, if price were to go, let's say, from P0 to P1, okay, the change... And GDP will be larger than if price went from, let's say, P3 to P2. Okay, it's a smaller increase because it's hard to increase capacity in the short run. And the short run is a time period where output prices are flexible, so the price of the good can be changed easier than, for example, in the media short run, but input prices are still fixed or inflexible because a lot of input prices are determined by contracts. So, for example, labor, you know, our, the cost of labor doesn't change every month. You know, we don't, the firms don't change your wage every month. You know, you're under a certain contract and, you know, your wage normally changes after a year, for example, or they might order a bunch of, Input. So, for example, like I said, I'm a let's say I'm a carpenter. I make tables. I might have already pre-ordered, you know, a ton of wood at a certain price. So my input price is fixed here in the short run. And then we have aggregate supply in the long run, and aggregate supply in the long run is vertical, meaning that a change in price does not affect output. Okay, so in the long run, okay, the economy will always be at its full employment GDP. And input prices here are flexible, output prices here are flexible. So profit levels 
um, will always be adjusted so firms can produce the right amount of output to be at full employment GDP. So in the long run, price changes in price level do not have an effect on um, output. Okay, we will be at full employment output whether we are at a higher price level or at a lower price level. Okay, so let's look about let's look at what shifts the aggregate supply curve. Okay, and just like with aggregate demand, a change in the price level would not shift the aggregate supply curve. It would only cause a movement along the curve. Okay, but what does shift the aggregate supply curve are changes in input prices, changes in productivity, and also changes in legal institutional environment. Okay. Okay. And so we have aggregate supply here. Let's say a change in one of the determinants of aggregate supply um, causes overall aggregate supply to increase, then aggregate supply here will shift to the right. And let's say a change in the determinants of aggregate supply um, decrease aggregate supply and it will be shown as a shift to the left over here. Okay. All right, so let's look at the first determinant of aggregate supply, and this is input prices. So domestic resources are labor, capital, and land, and so anything that causes the cost of labor, prices of capital, price of land to decrease will shift aggregate supply curve to the right. And anything that causes the cost of labor, uh, price of capital or land to increase, okay, will shift aggregate supply curve to the left. Okay, so these are all inputs. You know, so the cost of labor, capital, land, you know, is factored into the output prices. So, you know, again, let's say I make wooden tables and I need to hire an assistant. The more expensive my assistant is, the more expensive the tools are for me to build a table and then the more expensive it is for me to get um, a warehouse going where I can work, um, then the, le the less tables I will be able to supply at each price level, whether it's $100 a table, $200 a table, $300 a table, more expensive my input uh, prices are than the less tables I will be able to supply at each price level. Also, prices of imported resources. So, for example, you know, the price of oil. You know, oil is a big import here in the United States, so the more expensive oil is, the less uh, firms are able to supply goods and services at each price since their input price of oil is high. And the cheaper oil is, the more goods and services firms will be able to supply at each price level since one of their big inputs have dropped in price. And of course, exchange rates. Um, the cheaper the US dollar is or the more it depreciates, then the more expensive foreign resources will be. And so, you know, in a U.S. exchange, a U.S. depreciation of the dollar will shift aggregate supply to the left, and the U.S. appreciation of the dollar will shift aggregate supply to the right. Another determinant of aggregate supply is productivity, and what productivity essentially is is um, how much output is produced by an input, okay? And the more output that an input can produce, the higher the productivity is, and also the lower the per unit production cost is. So the an increase in productivity will shift aggregate demand, I mean, excuse me, aggregate supply curve to the right because it will enable uh, firms to get more out of their inputs which would then lower their per unit production cost. So anything that lowers per unit production cost will enable firms to uh, produce that good or provide that service at a lower cost. 
so they will be able to supply more at each price level uh, than uh, before. So an increase in productivity will shift aggregate supply to the right because it will decrease per unit production cost or a decrease in productivity will cause aggregate supply curve to shift to the left because it would increase per unit production cost. Usually what causes an increase in productivity is new technology. So if our jobs, let's say we're to write memos all day and, we, and let's say wage does not change so we get paid $100 a day and before we would write five memos a day with pen and paper and then we um, were given a computer and now we write 50 memos a day. Okay, so before, let's say the input cost Okay, was $100, and our total output was five memos. Okay, so it would be $20 a memo. And now with the computer, we can write 50 memos, and so it would be $2. A memo. Okay, so our per unit production costs dramatically dropped with new technology, and we can now supply more memos at each price level than before. And then the legal institutional environment, you know, this will alter per unit costs of output. So, you know, anything that increases taxes will increase per unit costs of output, so it would shift aggregate supply to the left. A decrease in taxes will shift aggregate supply to the right because it will lower a per, the per unit cost of output. Also subsidies, um, a business sus subsidy, a tax rate, or a business gaining a payment by the government, this will decrease per unit cost of output, so that would shift aggregate supply to the right. And if the subsidy were to expire, then it would increase per unit cost, so it would shift aggregate supply to the left. And also, uh, government regulation. Um, usually government regulation increases per unit cost because firms have to spend money in order to be in compliance with certain government regulations, especially if it's a firm that's, for example, like a plant that's polluting, etc. Um, they would have to spend money to reduce their emissions to be compliant. Um, and so that will increase per unit cost, but sometimes, or many times, you know, regulation is important to make sure that a business doesn't um, engaging in unethical practices that can be very costly in the long run for the economy as a whole. Okay, so equilibrium GDP is where aggregate supply intersects aggregate demand. Okay, so let me model this over here. Okay. And so we see that equilibrium... GDP here is 510 billion. Okay. It's where aggregate demand equals aggregate supply. And we have the price level here should be 100 right here. Okay. I don't know why these graphs don't look quite right on this app. Okay. So we see here if we were at price level of 92 okay then output supply would be less than output demanded so we are not in equilibrium and firms will want to increase their output um, in order to help match or to meet so, you know, prices will rise 
propel me back into equilibrium over here. And if the price level, let's say at price level 108 is higher, so we can just do it here. Okay, so we see aggregate supply is greater than aggregate demand. And so there has been overproduction, or we can say insufficient aggregate demand. And so uh, cons businesses will scale back and price levels will drop until the economy is back in equilibrium. Equilibrium can change. So let's see. We have aggregate supply here. Aggregate demand one. So let's say there's been an increase in government spending and an increase um, in investment spending. So I and G in increase, and this will shift aggregate demand curve to the right. Okay, so our equilibrium goes from QF to Q1. This scenario is modeling what we call demand pool inflation. So we can see when aggregate demand shifted to the right that the price level went up, which, you know, this is the overall price level in the economy. So everything increased in price. And so when there's an increase in price, we have inflation. And this was caused by an increase in aggregate demand. So anytime there's inflation that's occurring, Due to aggregate demand increasing, we call it demand pool inflation. And so now the economy, the actual GDP, is greater than the full employment GDP. So, you know, this what happened um, in the last few years of the 90s. This also happened um, in the 60s as well. Um, unemployment in this case would be lower than the natural rate of unemployment. And it's not necessarily a bad um, position to be in. The economy's doing good. There's a lot of jobs to be created. Yeah, there's a lot of jobs out there. Now, of course, you know, government needs to watch that inflation does not get out of hand. Um, you know, no asset bubbles be created or in the living standards to increase too much where they're not sustainable. Okay, let's model a recession. So let's say... Stock market decrease in value, um, and this shifted aggregate demand to the left. Okay, and so. Here we see we're at full employment GDP at point A, but since aggregate demand shifted to the left, okay, we are below full employment GDP. Um, so output is lower than at full employment, meaning that firms aren't producing as much. Therefore, they're receiving less income. Um, and then layoffs start to happen since firms don't need as much workers for the amount of output that is being demanded and we have a recession. Okay, so we see here. So whenever actual GDP is lower than at full employment GDP, we are in a recession. And whenever, like in the last slide, actual GDP is greater than full employment GDP, then we are in an expansion. Okay. Also, there's been a slight decrease in the price level. So we have deflation modeled here. Okay. Price level doesn't change downward very easy because prices are sticky. Okay. And we'll discuss this a little bit more in the next slide. One reason firms are slow to decrease the prices is because fear of price wars, that if they decrease their price, then another firm would decrease their price. 
and so they'll decrease the price even more, and then the other firm will decrease the price anymore, and then it will be hard to even make a profit because the price cuts may be at cost or even lower than cost. Um, another reason is menu costs. Menu costs will differ depending on the type of business, but for example, it costs money for restaurants to have to print out new menus. Normally what they'll do is just give out less food instead of changing price. Uh, it costs businesses money to print and mail new catalogs, for example, um, you know, to have to change everything on their boards or uh, let their customers know their new prices, etc. So, you know, the higher the menu cost is, then the less likely a firm is to actually decrease their price. Um, also, wage contracts. So, you know, normally when we get a job, it's, again, it's, you know, our wage doesn't change monthly, but we're usually under a labor contract, and sometimes it's, you know, a year, sometimes it's longer than that. So prices might, of the goods and services might go down before prices of labor. Well, usually uh, wages are the stickiest variable of all. They're the last to go down. People don't like getting wage cuts which kind of goes into efficiency wages. And efficiency wages essentially is, um, you know, you pay workers fairly or you pay them above average rather than they'll work for you harder than average, which would increase their productivity. You know, it's like if you're making $12 an hour as a teller at a bank and all the other banks are paying their employees $10 an hour, then the theory is, is that you'll work harder since you're getting paid more um, than other people are. And so, you know, firms are reluctant to decrease wages because they worry that worker morale will decrease and productivity will go down. And also because of minimum wages, if, you know, if firms are paying their employees minimum wages, then they can't cut their wage any further because of minimum wage laws. Okay, let's suppose aggregate supply were to shift. Okay, so we have aggregate demand here, and we have aggregate supply over here, and let's say it were to shift to the left. So, you know, what could be a cause of this? A sudden increase in the price of oil. So, like in the 70s, when uh, the Middle East put an embargo, especially Iran. Um, against the U.S. so they were not sending oil to the U.S. This dramatically increased oil prices and this shifted aggregate supply to the left since oil is an input and in any increase in an input price will shift aggregate supply to the left and what we see is a cost push inflation price level rises and it's because the increase in cost of inputs uh, shifted aggregate supply to the left and thus prices also increase because since the input prices of these goods increased then firms could only sell their goods at a higher cost in order to recoup the increase in input price. It, but however since the price is higher we see that consumers demand less of these goods. And so output is lower than full employment. So we have a situation that is called stagflation. So it's the merging of stagnation and then inflation. So kind of how we do the whole Brad and Angelina, Brangelina. So that's what stagflation is. And stagflation is when we are in a recession, but with higher price levels. Because before, we modeled when aggregate demand shifts to the left, we are in a recession, but there's downward pressure on rises, um, prices. excuse me. And in this scenario, when aggregate supply shifts to the left, okay, we have higher price level, but stagnating output. Okay, so we are still in a recession here, just with a higher price level, so we call it stagflation. And more specifically, this type of inflation here, since it is incurred by aggregate supply 
curve shifting to the left due to an increase in um, input costs, then we'll call this type of inflation cost push inflation. Again, just reiterating the earlier point. Okay, the period in the late 90s from 96 to right before the recession of 2001, um, you know, the United States experienced great economic growth. So, you know, let's model this. Let's start with aggregate supply over here. Okay. And aggregate demand one over here. Okay. So, um, economy was growing, you know, consumption was increasing, investment spending was increasing, for example, and it shifted aggregate demand okay, to the right. And so normally we would be here at point B, but what also happened during this period is there was an increase in technology. You know, we had um, the Internet, for example, better cell phones, better computers, etc. And so, you know, these improvements in technology shifted aggregate supply to the right. Okay, and so inflation was mild, but we had an expansion of GDP from point A to point C over here. Okay. In 2001, the economy experienced a, um, a recession. Um, it was, you know, short-lived, and so we common, you know, Economists said, well, we'll return back to growth, and it was moderate growth. And so, you know, the periods of having frequent recessions and sharp downturns like we did in the 70s you know, are gone from now on. It'll be mild recessions and, um, you know, longer time periods between recessions. And, of course, they were wrong because then 2007 happened. Okay, long story short, okay, um, there was a housing collapse and people were buying houses thinking that the houses were going to keep rising in value since housing prices have been rising in value for decades. Um, and they were taking out these jumbo loans that they could not really afford. Um, and so they, when the houses start dropping in value, some people just stopped paying on the loans or other people just couldn't afford it and defaulted on their loans. And banks then were not getting the money back that they had anticipated. And so th they started to collapse, and it led to a severe recession. This is, of course, a very abridged version. But long story short, a lot of collapsing going around led to recession, and the Federal Reserve immediately intervenes and makes short-term interest rates pretty much at zero. Um, why do they make it zero? Because, again, when interest rates are lower, it encourages investment spending and also it discourages savings. But... Um, what ended up happening, though, is that households were so spooked, okay, and even banks um, were reluctant to lend out more money, surviving banks, um, firms didn't want to engage in investment spending either, that even though sh interest rates were near zero, um, investment spending was still lackluster over there, and so the government also began um, a lot of uh, spending on programs to help boost government spending, that way it can increase aggregate demand to the right, you know, they had, for example, cash for clunkers going on and other projects. Okay, but even though we're no longer in a recession, GDP growth in general has been disappointing. Um, it is, like I said, there's a high rate of savings, you know, spending is so lackluster. And also there's been a, a lot of the households that have been using their existing money to pay off high debt loads. Because um, interest rates were still low even before the Federal Reserve lowered them uh, in response to the recession. So they had already been low before, and the households had already taken out a lot of money at those low rates. So now households were using those savings to pay off that higher debt as well.
the positive benefits of the stimulus were not spread out evenly. Um, you know, businesses hard as hit, for example, would have needed more of it um, than other businesses. But the way the stimulus worked, um, they it didn't really help them very much. Also, it caused a price increase rather than output gain. So because in the and this is for the short run because the fi you know there was a fixed supply of some goods and services and so you know an increase in aggregate demand due to some stimulus spending um, increased prices at the time because in the short run you know output tends to be more fixed so you know aggregate demand shifted to the right businesses were not yet able to increase their output so the effect was uh, an increase in price. All right, this concludes chapter 30.